<coughs> and you set? Set. You set, Eric? I'm good. I'm not. Yeah. Set, Jordan? Set, Joe? Yes. All right. <laughs> and uh, Lori, whenever you're ready, okay. take it away. When you guys start to engage conversations about God's design for marriage and sexuality, do you feel like no matter what you say, you like throw half a sentence out there and you get put into one of two different camps? And you, and you hold to what I believe is God's design for marriage, which marriage is a covenant one flesh union between one man and one woman for life. But you say something, you're like, yeah, this is what I believe. And then all of a sudden you get put in a camp with, with them, which I hate it. You have to use language, but I'm going to say more dogmatic or stereotypically conservative. And so I, I don't say that to, to belittle people, but because we have to use language, we get put in a camp with them, the extremists in that camp. And all of a sudden you're a bigot and you hate LGBT people and you want them to die because you hold to God's design for marriage. Or you say something like, man, I just really love my friend who's gay or transgender and I really want to walk alongside them well. And then, then you get put in that other camp, the more liberal extremist camp is what they might say. And oh man, you just don't take the word of God seriously. And it's just hard to know how to walk this nuanced road. And for me, so I've been in this sort of conversation and in this teaching field of teaching the church how to approach sexuality with the gospel for like five years now. And the truth is the arguments are important. And knowing how to walk and journey well alongside our LGBT friends without making them feel like garbage <laughs> is important. But I really think that there's one most important thing and what is that? Well, we're going to talk about what is that one most important thing for how we can advocate for God's design for marriage. But I'm going to share it with you by sharing my story in two parts. And one is when I was single and one is when I am now married uh, and, and through that marriage process. But the first one is when I was single and I'm going to use this, what I call a heart map. And it's kind of hilarious because we tried to map the heart. <laughs> However, bear with me. Sometimes it's nice to have visuals. But I was born um, at a very young age. That will be my one dad joke for the entire time. <laughs> I was born <laughs> at a, a very young age. Uh, and I am actually, I'm number nine of 12 kids. So I have eight older siblings and three younger siblings. And so it was super fun. It was like a cross between the best summer camp ever and like a one room schoolhouse and the Hunger Games <laughs> because you got to eat quick or you're not going to eat. <laughs> But actually really, I really loved it and still really enjoy it. But I was also born in addition to this amazing family, I was born with what we were all born with, which is this God shaped hole in our heart. And St. Augustine refers to it when he said, our heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. And so instead of though, just being like, oh, we have this God shaped hole in our heart. And like, the answer is Jesus. Yay, Jesus, which is true, it's not true. But my husband and I actually like to name what's inside that hole in our heart. And so we call them core needs. And so some of these core needs, these were present before the fall for things like to be affirmed. So the need for affirmation or to be delighted in or purpose. So this desire to have purpose or nurtured. And let's just take this one affirmation. We see this before the fall in that God created the world and he called it good. Good, 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 very good. You didn't have to. You could have just been like, creation, I'm awesome. <laughs> Which you wouldn't do that because it's like prideful, although he is awesome. But we feel these, what I call echoes of Eden in us mm -hmm. now. And so, I mean, like, I guess, you know, to be very vulnerable after this conversation, this talk that I give, I probably a part of me, this good need to be affirmed will be looking to you guys to be like, do you see me? Am I okay? Do you affirm me? 
Now I could, and I'm borrowing the next three words from Christopher West, who's a big Pope John Paul II, he studied him a lot. But I could, with that need for affirmation, I could be like a stoic. You need to shove that mess down. You don't need to be affirmed, you don't need to be delighted in, you don't need to be seen, you just shove it. Good Christians are just good and stoic. Or I could be like the addict. I could be like, am I okay? Am I okay? Do you affirm me? Do you see me? Or I could be like, and this is Christopher West's words, and so it can be a little controversial, but whatever, let's go with it. He calls it, we could be like the Christian mystic, which is someone who sits in the already not yet of those needs being filled. Mm -hmm. And so when you affirm me, I look through you, the created thing, to the creator who affirms me, mm -hmm. yet knowing that need for affirmation is not gonna be filled completely before eternity. But can I sit in that ache now? Can I rest in that, thank you God, I was affirmed and look to you who affirmed me. Yeah, I didn't know any of that mess when I was a kid. <laughs> I was just a kid and so I felt my core needs, but hello, I was born post fall. <laughs> Anybody else here born after the fall? Oh, yes, Amen. me too. <laughs> yes. And so because I was, I have this thing called sin nature. And so these good needs get filtered through the sin nature. And so I have a natural to me because of the fall, a natural default predisposition or orientation to get those good needs of my heart met. They are good in ways that don't actually satisfy me and don't glorify God. I was born that way. And so were you. But I was born, I'll say there's a few different defaults that I have. And one of them, two of them are very church acceptable. One is people pleasing. Oh, can I do this? You love me? Do you see me? Okay. We like that one in the church. Also performance. <laughs> I did a good job. Did I? Did I? That one gets stuff done. <laughs> but I also was born, I believe, with my post-fall self, with a desire to get those good needs met in ways that don't actually satisfy, don't actually glorify God, in sexual relationships to women. I felt that from a very young age. But I wasn't like, oh, this is a sinful desire that I need to surrender to the Lordship of Christ. Nah. <laughs> Growing up, I heard all this like, there's a war on marriage, and there's this gay agenda that's gonna like destroy the family. And so I'd feel that, and it wasn't like, oh, I gotta not do that. It was like, fragment yourself. Mm -hmm. cut, cut that mess out. And so then I get to college, and I feel there's another girl feels the same way about me as I do about her, and we started this secret same-sex relationship. And I was so confused by my own <laughs> brokenness and because it didn't feel like brokenness and yet it did because I knew it was, but I didn't fit my own stereotypes mm. of the homosexual lifestyle. Mm. Like I thought I had to be doing like lines of cocaine and like <laughs> sleeping around <laughs> and like super not a Christian. <laughs> but I'd be like sitting in church and I'd look down the aisle and I was like, I love Jesus more than like all of them, which is pride. And I recognize that. I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm just saying that I was really confused and I didn't know where I could go with this. And I reached a point where I was either going to kill myself because I thought that to be a Christian, I had to be straight. I just did. I thought that like I couldn't, I, th this was not a version of broken sexuality you could surrender to Christ. It was out there, it was other. So I was like, okay, well I love, so I, I need to abandon the faith. So I either kill myself because I cannot stop feeling this. It's, it's like heterosexual dudes that I talk to who are married to women and they're attracted to women, not their wife. They can't stop it. I couldn't stop it either. But for some reason I was categorically other. So I either kill myself to stop this or I come out as a lesbian atheist because I, I actually believed God's design for marriage was between one man and one woman. I just didn't believe I could live it out 
without hating myself constantly. And so there was someone who came alongside me in the middle of that mess. So here I was with these needs, inborn sin. I experience all this confusion. I start to believe that God hates me and that I should die or come out. That don't feel good. So I'm in this like cycle. This cycle, I feel this need and I go back and forth and I meet this woman who, oh, she was, okay, have you ever met people? Someone who you, when you meet them, they're like, they walk with God. And you're like, do they actually like touch the ground when they walk? <laughs> like, how does this work? And she technically, okay, she was my counselor. However, she was like a spiritual ninja Jedi Dumbledore <laughs> who knew God. She wasn't actually a Jedi. Like, I know there's, there's a religion. She knew Jesus. But she really... She understood this heart stuff. Mm -hmm. And she'd ask me these bizarro questions like, Lori, when you are envisioning this woman, even this ideal perfect woman, what are you envisioning? And I was like, awkward. I am for sure not sharing that with you. But do you know what words started tumbling out of my mouth? They were not sexual words. It was heart language. I just want to be seen. I want to be known. I want to be loved. I want to be affirmed. She said, that's not a bad thing, Lori. You're just, you're walking it to a place where, Lori, will an ideal perfect woman ever meet this in you? I was like, no, but I know Jesus doesn't either. So don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but she taught me that, you know what? We can know Jesus and even feel like we're experiencing levels of Jesus. But we got all sorts of barriers between the need meter of our souls and those core needs. I had lots of lies that had been brewing inside my heart, not just about same-sex marriage, but just about who is God. I had calcification of bitterness in my soul toward people who had hurt me before that I needed to lament and forgive. And all of this work, really, what she did wasn't some fancy therapy, like legit. People will refer to like reparative therapy. She wasn't any of that. She really taught me how to know God in the deepest places of my heart. And her tools were spiritual disciplines like lament and forgiveness and really like, Lori, you feel like God hates you? Show me in the Bible where he hates you. <laughs> really, God, you, you, really, Lori, you think that God hates women? Let's look at how God is a motherly nurturing figure. And all of that walking alongside, it started to carve a place between my good needs and the need meter of my soul. And I fell in love, <laughs> not with a person, but with Jesus. I remember I, I was so sick. For those of you who are single and people ask you constantly, when are you getting married or who are you dating? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry on behalf of all of us. <laughs> people would ask me that all the time. And so I just like bought like an engagement looking ring and I was just like, and I'm married. <laughs> and they'd be like, who are you married to? I'm like, a guy, Jesus, but whatever. <laughs> Jesus? No, I mean, it was Jesus. It was Jesus. But I really felt like I was when I was in a room and I felt so lonely and lost. I would picture him sitting across the room, like winking at me, seeing me, noticing me in those deepest places of my heart. And I was so grateful and I started to dream and hope. And I was like, maybe I'll go get my doctorate. I'll go be a professor on one of the coasts, me and Jesus. And then I sensed God's hand on my shoulder saying, I have someone for you. And I was like, nope. <laughs> no, I'm a happy single person, Jesus. I really, I, I felt like I was living out revelation where like the Bible starts with marriage and ends with marriage. And so it's telling you there's a theme of marriage throughout. And here it was me married to Jesus, like in revelation, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean. Then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the lamb. I was so living in that already, not yet. So I was pretty mad when God said, I have some one for you. Now the true story is 
my attractions, my story is not prescriptive for everyone, but he called me Lori. He said, Lori, the mode I want you to do the mission to image me and make disciples is as a married woman. Marriage and singleness are equal modes to do this mission to image God and make disciples. But he called me, Lori, to marriage. And he didn't have me fall in love with all men. That would be weird. (laughs) (laughs) He had me fall, my heart connect to one man, Hmm. Matt. Hey, thank you. And it was really this heart connection that led to this mission connection that could lead to the physical connection, which when we got married, we truly thought we were like ahead of the game. (laughs) We're like, all y'all suckers who got married because you just wanted to make your lust Christian legal, (laughs) we're way better. We're way better than you. (laughs) Because we're like, we get it. There's this mission. We have this deep friendship. Oh, but I'll tell you what, guys, seven years in, I don't know what it is about year seven, eight, nine. It's like usually the tough years. I got some nods over here. It, I, we had, we gave birth. I gave birth to our second daughter. (laughs) And when she was born, it was something about her birth and the situation in our home that sparked a memory of trauma for me when I was young that I hadn't processed yet. And so this came up and then it matched, it magnetized to my attractions to the same sex. And although Matt was not my perpetrator, this created this perfect storm where all of a sudden I was like, no. And my same sex attractions were like, well, you don't even like him anyway. So I had this like kind of fear, annoyance at him from my trauma. And then my attractions were like, well, you don't like him anyway. Why don't you just leave? Mm -hmm. And so I went on a silent retreat in the middle of winter. It was December and it was beautiful, sparkling snow. And I packed in my suitcase on this silent retreat a question. And it was, what do you want? A friend had asked me that a couple days before and she assumed she knew the answer. She's like, you and Matt, you're so cute. And your story is like so ridiculous. You want Matt. (laughs) But here I went, (laughs) looking over this beautiful sparkling snow, and my heart felt just as cold. Mm -hmm. And I took my laptop, and I went back and forth with God. And I wrote down that question, what do I want? What do I want? And I said, I want to leave Matt. I want to be like other liberated lesbians who are best friends with their husband, and yet they find their partner. And I made a pro-con list. Pros. I wouldn't have to fight the world anymore. Do you know how exhausting it is to do this job? To be constant, to have your very existence, to be married to a guy, to be speaking like you are, to have kids, and to have people constantly fighting you, not just when you speak out, but when you're existing. I wouldn't have to fight anymore. I could picture people being like, oh, finally, Lori, come to our side. Oh, we've been waiting for this. And then I was like, okay, another pro. Well, maybe I'd find my partner and I'd have the type of physical intimacy that I want. Another, maybe I'd have friends. But what about the cons? Thought about my kids. Oh, I didn't want to confuse them. And I knew that I would. I'd lose some friends, some really good friends. But I'd probably write them off as like not actual friends. They're just like those dogmatic conservative haters. And so I'd like rewrite that script so they'd be on that side. Mm -hmm. I could do that. I kept writing. I might go to hell. Hmm. I thought about 1 Corinthians 6, which these verses mess me up. I'm not saying... (laughs) I would go to hell. I'm just saying these messed me up, which say, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin, which, okay, let's just say this is, this is ongoing unrepentant sin. 
This isn't people who are like, oh, okay, I'm just over here. It's not people who are tempted. This is ongoing, unrepentant sin. Also note, there's a lot more sins than just same-sex sin in this list. Those who worship idols, who ongoingly, constantly put other things above God. That's idol worship. Or commit adultery or male prostitutes or practice homosexuality, which is the word arsenokoitis, which is a word that Paul coins here. And it really technically means male and couch. And it literally links back to Leviticus 18 and 20, where it talks about men not supposed to be having sex with one another. So this is not people who wrestle with it. This is not people like me who have this ongoing wrestling. It's people who are engaging in sexual sin physically or, according to Jesus in Matthew 5, in their minds, ongoing, unrepentant. Or thieves, or greedy people, drunkards, abusive, cheap people. None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. I wrote, and I was like, well, it's convicting, but not enough. <laughs> and then God brought to mind the book of Jude. I never read Jude. <laughs> but the day before, it was in my reading. And I was like, okay. So I read Jude, and I was just sitting there, and I was like, wrestling with what I wanted and what felt natural to me. And then I opened up Jude and God brought this to mind. It says, this is 17 verses 17 and 19, because it's only one chapter. But you, my dear friends, must remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ predicted. They told you that in the last times there'd be scoffers whose purpose in life is to satisfy their ungodly desires. These people are the ones who are creating divisions among you. They follow their natural instincts because they do not have God's spirit in them natural instincts, what feels natural to them, perhaps because of the fall, because they do not have God's spirit in them. And I thought, if I follow what's natural to me, will I not have God's spirit in me? But everything was on the table. And so I wrote, well, what's your spirit even give me anyway, God? And I tell you what, I experienced in the next two seconds what I believe was a micro taste of hell. Like of what it might feel like <laughs> to experience total separation from God. And guys, I was so cold and I was so terrified. And it wasn't like I just felt empty. I felt like I was emptiness. <laughs> and it was like I couldn't suck life enough. And when those two seconds were over, I was like, what? <laughs> it was just me and God. And I kept writing and I was like, man, God, your spirit is not just some like Jiminy Cricket, may your conscience be your guide person. Mm -hmm. He's the only source of comfort and hope and life and peace. The only source away from him is total nothing, freezing fear. And I was like, okay, God, okay. I want you. So I want what you have from me. Even if my natural instincts go against it, I want. And so the next morning I packed up my suitcase. It was 6 a.m. in the middle of a blizzard because that's all Michigan knows how to do. <laughs> and we, I drove home and I surrendered not to like go home and kiss Matt and be like, oh my gosh, <laughs> you're so perfect. No, <laughs> I honestly didn't know how God was gonna fix our marriage. I didn't know, but I was surrendered to God. So I said, not my will, but yours. Is that the language of our culture right now? God, even if, my, even if my flesh opposes it, you're God. No, we're like my kids who are like, okay, I want cotton candy, ice cream, and Netflix. No, Disney <laughs> Plus. <laughs> and I, I have enough wisdom, praise the Lord, most days, not every minute of every day, to know to say no, because I know that that life will lead to death. Do we have a father who has enough foresight to know that there may be certain life that we want to follow, even if it's natural to us, that leads to death? 
do we have someone exist who is unbiased, yet completely biased toward all of us equally? <laughs> lover, judge, savior, who is all powerful, all knowing, and who made us. Not only did he give us a book, like just drop kick it from heaven to explain the path to flourishing, he lived it out himself and forged the path for us to live a life of abundance for forever. Does he exist? Like, yeah. His law doesn't outline, oh, here's, guys, sorry, I'm keeping you out from all the fun. His law outlines where we can have the most freedom and abundance and sometimes fun, but the most good. This is how like Psalm 119, and ever, anyone ever read Psalm 119? And you're like, yeah, get over the law. But this is how he can say this. How I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your word is a lamp for me, my feet and a light for my path. This is how we can say that and not say it like a joke. <laughs> because he said, you explain the path to flourishing to me. So I got home and I was committed to God. And I was like, all right, I'm into the marriage, God. But I also don't get marriage. I don't get it. I don't know if you guys are like me, if you've listened to marriage podcasts or sermons or anything about marriage, a way that some people approach it is with a lot of gender jokes. Or it's, they're trying to build rapport with their audience. And some of them are funny. It's okay. But some of them have a hint of actual bitterness. Where it's like, women, they're all so controlling, aren't they? Or men, aren't they all idiots? And me, as a same-sex attracted woman who is in this covenant marriage with my husband, I hear this and I'm like, yeah, why are you married? Like, you seem to, like, legit hate each other. And so I started studying it even more, not just the arguments against same-sex marriage. I wanted to know why male-female marriage. I don't get it. It seems like a cosmic joke. Mm. So I started doing some research. Now this is one of my favorite arguments for God's design for marriage, and it's, I love it because it's so simple. And it's Jesus, the Pharisees, they do as the Pharisees do, and they're trying to corner him and trap him. So some Pharisees, this is Matthew 19, 3 to 5, came to him to test Jesus, and they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? And now Jesus says way too much. He could have said something really simply, but he says way too much in response. And he says, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female. He goes OG Testament on this. He goes back to the beginning and, and calls forth this male and female. He didn't have to. Genesis 127 is what he's referring to. And it says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and the two will be, and he'll be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. Which two? Two people who love each other? Because here's the thing, the one flesh, you know that there's not a word for, like, we don't say the word marriage in Bible. The word for marriage in the Bible is a one flesh union. So the two will become married. So according to the Bible, which two? The two, male and female. Biblically, the only one flesh union that's biblical is between male and female. This is my friend Preston Sprinkle. He's just, he's the baller in this conversation. We'll just call him that. Uh, the one flesh union here, syntactically, logically, theologically, biblically, ethically, however you want to frame it, is not simply two humans coming together. So you guys, the question is not, do my two gay friends love each other? That's not the question. Mm -hmm. It's not, are they attracted to each other? I don't doubt that. The question we need to be asking is, what is marriage? So this one flesh union, the two one flesh union, the only way biblically, I mean, you can legally get married, same sex, but biblically is male and female. Marriage is precisely the male and female coming together in a one flesh union. So I studied this and I'm like, okay, but why male and female? Ephesians 5, this is the preeminent passage on marriage. Help me answer this. 
For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two, again, wife, man, will become one flesh. There's the marriage word. Mm -hmm. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. I've heard people try and interpret this passage and be like, the mystery is, isn't it crazy mysterious how men and women fall in love? <laughs> and I'd be like, yeah, it is. <laughs> Super mysterious. <laughs> But no, the mystery is that Christ wants to, will, and they already not yet marry the church. So wait, 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 wait. God, how different is he from us? He's far above every ruler and power and principality and authority, it says in Ephesians. He's ontologically, totally, completely different from us. And yet God of the universe wants to marry dusty old Adam, us. He's so different from us, and yet he wants to be one with us. So is it possible that when we do this gender joking about men are such, meh, women are so, meh, that we're wrong to roll our eyes at our differences instead of celebrate them? And instead of celebrate that Jesus, when he died to be one with us, we as humanity are to die to ourselves to be one with him, and that's what marriage metaphors. Mm -hmm. At the grocery store, in our neighborhoods, in our homes, when we don't roll our eyes at our spouses, when we don't, you know, we can make jokes, but when we don't have them rooted in actual bitterness, but we're seeking oneness with them, we metaphor to the world God's desire to be one with us. Which, well, I'll just do this as Christopher West. God is infinitely other infinitely different from his creation, and yet this infinitely different creator does not hold himself aloof. God wants to be one with his creation. God wants to unite with his creation. God wants to marry his creation. This is what the mystery of Jesus Christ, the mystery of God taking on flesh is about, the marriage of creator and creature, the marriage of divinity and humanity, which here we are. <laughs> We're at the number one thing we can do to advocate for God's design for marriage. Whether you are married or single, joyfully live into the marriage metaphor you have been called. If you have been called to singleness, whether it's for your whole life or for a temporary time, joyfully do it when we are begrudging it or we're constantly saying that, you know, I just wish I had my person. Our LGB friends who are hearing this are like, yeah, me too. <laughs> but when we're like, yeah, I still have this ache or I have this longing, but I'm married to Jesus. Mm -hmm. You metaphor to us married people, how we're going to be in eternity when there's no marriage except the marriage between Christ and the church, when you joyfully live in communion, when union with God and community with the church, you show us heaven. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of my friend Peter, who does this well, who started this modern day monastery in Nashville, and he's committed to celibacy and singleness to the glory of God. And the world looks at him and they don't get it. And yet part of them craves it. Mm. Or another single friend who's been single for the majority of her life. She's in her 70s now. And when I'm with her, she'll talk to me and then she'll talk to Jesus like he's right there. Because he is. Mm. <laughs> and I'm like looking around for him and I'm like, oh, oh, oh my goodness. I could have that relationship with Jesus because she's so married to him looks at her and they don't get it and get something in them craves it. And if we are married, we need to stop the gender joking and the eye rolling at all oh, men, oh women, and we need to celebrate and die to our version of brokenness to be one with our spouse. Yes, I do that with my sexual brokenness, but also just my selfishness. <laughs> In Matt, my husband, he dies to himself and he's not always naturally attracted to me. Believe me, I'm not that cute. <laughs> and he, before our marriage pain, he, he dealt with pornography addiction and all of that. And so he dies to his natural, to himself, 
fleshly defaults to be one with me. And I pray that when the world sees us at the grocery store and in our neighborhoods and in our home, that they see God. I'm thinking of one of my friends, my assistant, Amanda, and her, when her husband came forward to her with his alcohol addiction, his pornography addiction, and cheating on her as a pastor. And she saw his repentant heart. That modeled to me when she loved him, where he was at. That told me, I said, oh, God, I cheat on you so much, Jesus. And yet you want oneness with me. The world doesn't get that, and yet the world craves that. Or my friend Ben, who wrestles with his biological gender, and he's sexually attracted to his wife, but he wrestles with his biological gender, and he's fighting for both difference from his wife, and yet union with his wife. And I think, God, you're so different from me. And yet you want union with me. The world doesn't get it, and yet something in them wants it. That's why this is the most important thing, guys. We need to joyfully live into the marriage metaphor that we've been called. The world won't get it, but they'll want it. They'll want him, which that's the whole thing. But we can't do this, guys. It is impossible. But with God as single or married, all things are possible. So maybe you're like me in this pandemic life where you're realizing, wow, I needed Jesus, but now I really need Jesus. So let's pray now and ask him to help us make this impossibility possible because of him. Will you pray with me? Mm -hmm. Whew, Jesus. We cannot live into our marriage metaphors that you've called us into on our own strength, God. We can no longer live like sprinkle a little Jesus on me prayer. We need you. Oh, we need you, God. Every hour we need you and the world is watching us, Jesus. In the grocery store, in our neighborhoods, and in our homes, help us, God, to live into this marriage metaphor you've called us into joyfully. We cannot do it without you, God. We need you. Thank you that you will meet us here because this is your will for us. In your name, amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. <laughs>